Let's talk through some of the biggest stories of the day, including, of course, the inquiry announced yesterday by the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, about Sarah Everard's murder, and also the end of universal credit uplift. Joining us to do that is Jason Reed, head of Young Voices UK. It's a non-profit talent agency working with sort of the next generation of political commentators. Thank you very much for joining us, Jason. And let's start with the latest from the Conservative Party conference. What were your highlights yesterday? Lots of big, meaty speeches. Good morning, Hank. It's great to be with you. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on, but um, you can't help feeling that this is a Conservative Party that's still struggling, or a government rather, that's still struggling to find its direction a little bit. Throughout Boris Johnson's premiership, he's had the advantage, so to speak, of being um, there during a crisis, at first during Brexit, and then, of course, during the pandemic. Um, it, I think he's starting to realise now that he was playing politics on easy mode, perhaps, and now he has to work out what kind of Prime Minister he wants to be, and he's got to set the direction for uh, for global Britain post-Brexit as well. And so there have been a lot of questions asked about whether the Tory party is still the party of low taxes and of fiscal responsibility. And uh, he and his, his new ministers after the reshuffle have, have a lot of difficult questions to answer about what the long-term future of the Conservative Party actually looks like. Boris has said that he wants to be Prime Minister for longer than Margaret Thatcher was. Uh, but it's unclear at the moment what he actually stands for and what his legacy will be. So he's got a lot of thinking to do. Or perhaps his speech later today will cast a bit more light on what we can expect from him. Yeah, Jason, good morning. Yeah, what, what can we expect the Prime Minister to say? I mean, this is a huge speech, isn't it, to be quite frank with you? There's a lot to, to deal with, a lot of concerns. Well, as you mentioned, he's, uh, it looks like he's going to come out all guns blazing, accusing former governments, both Conservative and Labour, of uh, delay and dither, which is a bit of a uh, harking back to Theresa May accusing people of dithering and delaying during the Brexit negotiations. Um, but I think it's more, it's more of this kind of struggling to find his feet, struggling to find his position as a sort of peacetime prime minister, as someone who's not necessarily dealing with a long-term ongoing crisis. We still have our issues, of course, but he's got to decide what kind of prime minister he wants to be. He's going to talk a lot about uh, the need to build a high-wage, high-skill employment country. It seems like he's going to use the ongoing supply chain issues to attack immigration. He's been doing some of that already. Uh, and so it looks like a, a big part of Boris Johnson's post-Brexit global Britain is going to be less immigration, which you could say, on the one hand, that's questionable. Is that really a global Britain? On the other hand, perhaps that was a, a motivating factor for lots of people voting for Brexit as they want a more nationalist Britain, which takes in fewer people um, from other countries. Of course, we've seen recently with the HGV driver shortage, um, having to extend visas to uh, other countries to ask workers from abroad to fill those gaps. We've very much been relying on immigration. So it'll be interesting to see how Boris Johnson uh, skirts around that and what kind of note he tries to strike. And I think this debate around tax rises is really important as well. There's a lot of discontent among the Conservative members and grassroots about the direction in terms of economic policy that this government is taking. The Conservative Party, of course, is supposed to be the party of uh, low taxes and uh, a smaller state and a lot of people feeling betrayed by the recent announcement of a national insurance rise and the looming spectre of possible other tax rises as well. And of course, you mentioned the front page of the Times with the possible minimum wage increase and all sorts of other possible uh, economic intervention coming down the road uh, from this Tory party. So lots still unclear about what this government is actually intending to do in the next few years. The Prime Minister is going to speak after 11 and we'll bring that to you here on GB News. Let's look back very briefly, if we can, to yesterday. Priti Patel announcing this inquiry into Wayne Cousins, why it was that these problems that clearly had been identified didn't lead to him then losing his job. Why do you think she's made that decision? Well, it seems like an inquiry was a necessary and unavoidable step at this point. The pressure has built so much that there is a need to look into this properly and there is a need for Priti Patel to be seen to take action on this. To my ears, it rings a little bit hollow at the moment, mainly because, um, of course, Cressida Dick, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, is still in her position. There have been lots and lots of calls for her to resign, but I don't know, perhaps she has some very compelling compromat on Sadiq Khan and on people in the government, and she's still in her position, and she's still receiving wholehearted speeches of support with people saying that she is the right person to see in the cultural changes and the policy changes that need to happen in the police. 
Uh, but I think to a lot of people, it's going to seem like having an inquiry like this, uh, uh, making change in Westminster or investigating what happened in Westminster um, is a little bit pointless if you're not even willing to take that first step of the leader responsible who oversaw this uh, taking the step of resigning. That, that would have been step one on a very long road towards the police slowly starting to regain a bit of trust and regain their reputation. If you look back to uh, Harold Shipman, for example, after that case and the culture around palliative care in the NHS changed dramatically. I think it's much less clear that the Wayne Cousins case was a case of one bad apple. It seems like a much more widespread cultural change. And yet at the same time, um, there aren't those changes taking place in order to make sure that happens again. And that means we really do run the risk of there being more Sarah Everards in the future, no matter what the inquiry that Pretty Patel is starting comes up with. Mm, absolutely. Um, let's just talk again about today. We see the withdrawal of this uh, £20 a week uh, universal credit cut. Very controversial, uh, this, this, Jason. I mean, this has been a lifeline for many. However, it was only a temporary measure. Um, it, it's going to be a difficult one for the Prime Minister to tackle today and, and for many who will see now that drop in, in what they're, they're, they're taking home. Yeah, as you say, that's a really difficult issue and it's incredibly hard to find the right note. Whichever uh, road you go down with this, you're going to upset a, a great number of people. On the one hand, as you say, the people who are poorest in our society are relying on universal credit. And so there's a very strong argument to be made that we shouldn't be cutting off uh, the money when they, when they need it most. I believe the figure is that 2.5 million more people are on universal credit now than were at the start of the pandemic. And so cutting off that kind of access to those vital funds is not what we should be doing right now. Um, it's going to cost, I believe, around £6 billion a year to maintain if we were to maintain that £20 uplift. And meanwhile, we're able to spend uh, £100 billion on HS2, for example. So it seems like a small amount of money to improve people's lives so much. At the same time, we have a huge COVID bill already. Someone's going to have to pay off the COVID debt, whether that's uh, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. Uh, so there's also an argument to be made that from the fiscal responsibility point of view, and of course the Tories want to be seen as the fiscally responsible party, uh, that at some point you have to say, OK, we have to stop spending money and instead we have to be looking at more creative, more sustainable ways uh, to help support people like investing in things like the apprenticeship scheme, for example, helping people to get into work and stay in work um, so that we're not just borrowing from future gener generations in order to subsidise people living today. And just very quickly and finally, so we're hearing from Boris Johnson today, that is the, the, the big speech. We're also going to hear from Nadim Zahawi, the former vaccine minister on the great British vaccine success. What can we expect? A sort of celebration of the rollout? Yes, I think we can always expect a celebration of the rollout whenever the government mentions vaccinations at all. Of course, Nadim Zahawi was rewarded um, for the perceived f success of the vaccine rollout with a big promotion in the reshuffle, now the Secretary of State for Education. Um, I expect then we might hear something more on the issue of, of vaccine passports, although the government seems to contradict itself on that issue all the time. They're definitely coming in, they're not coming in at all, now they're just Plan B. Um, so there might be a little bit more confusion perhaps on that, um, but we'll have to wait and see what he said. But we can, we can very much rely on the fact that there will be a lot of bigging up of the success of the vaccine rollout and the, the role that Britain can play going forward in donating vaccines to other countries and helping uh, other countries around the world to come out the other end of the pandemic. Jason Reid, thank you very much, Head of Young Voices UK. And speaking of